Thank you all for joining us today for Data Logger Basics. We are going to get started here in just a moment. I see there's still a few people trying to log on to join us. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I will be your host, Taryn Picard, and uh, your presenter for Data Logger Basics today will be my coworker, Eileen Sander. So right there, you have a lovely image of me. So we'll move on from that, and talk a little bit about the agenda. Um, before I jump right into the agenda, I just wanted to, of course, answer the question that's on everybody's mind. What's going on with Onset and the coronavirus? So I just want you all to rest assured, Onset is still up and running. We have all of our, uh, well, the majority of our employees tucked away safely at home. We're working remotely, uh, but then we do still have a full staff in the building from our production team, our shipping and receiving guys. They're all there taking care uh, of any data loggers you need to order and shipping them out the door for us. So don't you worry, and we, we all wish you to stay safe as well. So to cover the agenda, we're gonna go over what is a data logger, types of data loggers, how are loggers used, selecting a data logger, we'll cover some real world applications, and then at the end, we'll leave some time for some Q&A. little overview of who we are as a company. So Onset is a world leader in data logging. That lovely picture there shows our facility. You can see all the solar panels we have on top. Uh, we are actually located on Cape Cod. So nice little resort area for us. And we do all of our engineering, our building, marketing sales, everything all at that one location. We are a US manufacturing location. Uh, and we take a lot of pride in our lean management. So uh, one really nice thing about Onset is we've gone through lots of lean training. We try to be super organized and efficient with everything we do, and uh, we're also ISO certified. So the question that's on everybody's mind, is HOBO an acronym? A lot of people think it is, but I'm going to tell you the truth. It is not. Uh, in fact, it's kind of a nice story. Um, HOBO came because the original founder of Onsa Computer was just really infatuated with trains. So we have a whole suite of products really named after things that have to do with the railroad. So Green Line, Stowaway, Boxcar, uh, you name it. We, we've come up with a few different names and now we're, the one that's kind of stuck and lasted the longest was Hobo. So the webinar details, this webinar will last about 40 minutes. We'll leave plenty of time, like I said, at the end for questions. Um, and if we don't get to your question, you know, never hesitate to reach out to us. We have several application specialists that will be available to help you. If you ever want to give us a call, we can certainly take time to review your individual needs and make recommendations. Um, and if you do have questions, feel free to type them in uh, to the section of your panel there that says questions. And this webinar is being recorded, so you can certainly re-listen to it over and over again. Uh, at your at your leisure. So I have the honor of 
presenting to you Eileen Sander. She has been with Onset for over 22 years, so she is by far the expert in data logging. Um, she specializes in assisting our researchers, consultants, government agencies, um, and really focuses on the water quality and, and environmental side of the business. Uh, but again, Eileen's been here long enough where she knows all about our indoor and building performance monitoring as well. So any types of questions you have, uh, feel free to ask those to her and she can certainly help answer them for you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am going to talk about exactly what a data logger is, uh, how to choose the best option uh, for what you have in mind, and why it's important to have time and date stamped measurements over a period of time, months and years, and you don't have to be there. Um, to get started, we're going to ask you a question. Are you currently using data loggers? And we are gonna launch a, a little poll. Uh, we'd like to get a feel for if you uh, have some experience with the data loggers or if this is brand new for you. And we'll give that a minute. And it looks like Eileen, uh, the results are pouring in. We have a lot of people currently using Hobo data loggers, a few using other types of data loggers, and a handful that have not used loggers at all. So I'm gonna just give it one quick second here. I'm gonna close out the poll and post those results for you all to see. And you can see there, we've got 63% using Hobos. That's what we like to see. All right, we, we hope to make that 100%. All right, well, I think you'll enjoy this. All right, first of all, what is a data logger? Um, it is an electronic device. It's recording measurements at a time and date that you set and you choose the logging interval. Do you wanna log very quickly? Is that important to get a measurement uh, as quickly as every second, for example? Or you can set it for every 18 hours. Um, if you're logging temperature data or something that's not going to change that quickly, you would not want to um, log that quickly. You'd have a lot of data that isn't changed, um, changing for soil temperatures, for example. They are electronic devices. They have uh, memory. They have storage. Uh, one or more sensors. They're designed to work either indoors or outdoors or underwater. You wouldn't use an underwater uh, data logger in particular for an application where uh, a small temperature relative humidity data logger would be more appropriate or vice versa. You would not use an indoor data logger outside uh, unless you're going to put it in a Tupperware container to protect it. And then it's reading the temperature of the inside of the container, not what you're looking for. So you're gonna plan uh, what you wanna monitor and your environmental conditions, the memory size that you need. How do you use a data logger? You will download software typically uh, or a mobile app on your computer or on your uh, device. You're gonna connect the data logger and launch parameters, that is setting up your interval. You're gonna place it where you want to be recording. We often get asked, uh, for example, if you're in a museum application, how many do you need to cover a space? That could change floor to ceiling. Um, if you're near an air conditioning vent, if you're near a window, um, you're going to collect data where the data logger is mounted. It's going to be fairly representative, but uh, typically they may cover a, a, a generalized space and we give recommendations for that based on your application. It is going to be recording based on the time and date that you selected and when you told it to start. And you could choose start at noon today or noon tomorrow, for example, and log every 15 minutes. So you have a data file that's going to look um, nice. When you're reading out a data logger, and, and this is more pertinent to uh, USB, um, 
you're going to reconnect to the computer. If you're reading it out to your mobile device, you're going to tap on your phone, open the app, and it's going to pop up. We'll have some screenshots available to give you a better idea of what that looks like. And last, you're going to download that data file and save it so you can read it out and send it or share it. Now, there are several types of data loggers. This is the simplest method, which, which would be important for indoors. Um, a state logger is going to wake up and look for something to happen every second. So for example, if you wanna collect runtime, you don't want it set on an interval that you have to log every second because it's a lot of data to look at and it's not what you're interested in. You're interested in, does this motor start and does it stop? So you would choose a state logger so that it's just going to record that change of state or a door opening or closing, for example. And you'll have a time and a date stamp. Interval loggers is what I was referring to a moment ago, where you're going to set it up to record at an interval you select. And typical, it could be every 15 minutes. Uh, it could be every half an hour. Um, and you might have an expectation of how that uh, data might change. And of course, that's something you can control and change it at any time. Um, this is a little bit of giving you an idea on what that graph looks like. You will always have a text file. You'll have time, date, and text data, but your graphs are going to look like the state data logger on the left where you've got it's off, it's on. It's still on, it's still on, it's off. The logging interval at the right is looking every, let's say every few minutes, and it's going to time and date stamped at each interval you select. That's the interval-based loggers are used most of the time for almost everything else, uh, except for runtime or a state change. Some common uses for data loggers. I'm going to go from the bottom left um, clockwise. We have temperature and light at the bottom. The data logger in that small picture is a Bluetooth logger designed for underwater. Um, an indoor CO2 logger with temperature and relative humidity and carbon dioxide is for indoors in a building, field conditions, weatherproof data loggers, that's a temperature relative humidity that communicates via Bluetooth within 100 feet away. The advantage of that is you don't have to connect to a computer at the site. It's a nice time saver since everyone is using their smartphones anyway. Occupancy and light at the time is an example of a state logger. It's going to look when the lights are on, and it's also going to look based on a temperature reading, is the room occupied? So your data file would give you the lights are on and is someone in that space. Temperature relative humidity at the right hand top clockwise about one o'clock is basic temperature relative humidity used for office space. That's an indoor data logger shown with your graph on a smart device. Remote field conditions, we have several models of weather stations, um, station monitoring, which is very flexible to add uh, all sorts of parameters, and I'll get to that very shortly in the next slide. And we have water level data loggers and multiple methods of getting that data, whether it's to your smartphone, by a cellular or ethernet or Wi-Fi, or you're pulling it out of a stream where you need it to be camouflaged and under completely underwater at all times. These are the indoor measurements that we cover, uh, temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, air velocity, um, we don't have a VOC sensor any longer, um, but there are those available that would be compatible with our data loggers. Measuring energy and power, 
We have plug load loggers, which means uh, there's a device that can capture uh, a piece of equipment. Think about your microwave plugged into or a vending machine that's plugged into power. We can do kilowatts, kilowatt hours, watts, um, watt hours when you're doing energy studies. And you see the list of different options based on the piece of equipment that you're trying to monitor. Time of use, again, is that state logger. Lights are on or off, the motor's running, the window's open, somebody's in the building. Here's an overview of some of these indoor data loggers. They should not get wet and they should not be in a condensing environment, such as a greenhouse. These are indoor only. Um, again, we're covering pulse state event, um, carbon dioxide, temperature relative humidity, that can communicate USB and Bluetooth, um, small state loggers, and uh, Bluetooth temp RH, and the occupancy light and off. To give you an idea, these are a little bit bigger on the screen than actual size. These are all almost um, the small ones with the LCD screens are small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. These are two of our newest Bluetooth indoor data loggers. They do have an environmental rating of IP54. That means they can be in an environment where they are protected from uh, limited dust ingress, um, more robust in any environmental type application or an industrial type application, even if they're getting a, a bit sprayed down. And these can accommodate temperature, relative humidity, light sensors, AC current, AC amperage, additional temperature sensors, uh, temperature sensors that could be put on a pipe for the uh, supply and return on equipment. The outdoor uh, measurements, again, we do water temperature. There are multiple uh, styles, fairly inexpensive data loggers for water temperature. They range in the depth they can be placed at. They'll be ranging in the accuracy that you need. We have water level conductivity for fresh and salt water. Um, the salinity is, of course, for saltwater measurements. Soil moisture, water flow can be attached to flow meters, or they can do a calculation based on uh, from water level sensors. And we do have pH measurements, which uses Bluetooth. On the weather station parameters, um, we have temperature and relative humidity. PAR, which is for plant uh, light ranges. The light intensity is covering solar radiation. It reads in watts per meter squared. It is part of the suite of sensors that might be used for evapotranspiration for more agricultural type applications. Rainfall, of course, wind speed and direction. Solar radiation I mentioned is part of the light intensity suite and leaf wetness. Um, helps in predicting plant disease, and that would be part of our weather station suite. Uh, other signals, four to 20 milliamps. Uh, many of our, our, our stations can accommodate some third-party sensors. If there's a sensor you need to use for a particular uh, detail in your application, we can usually accommodate that if it's a four to 20 milliamp uh, analog signal. It's just a little plug-in module that would be um, compatible with our weather station. Pulses typically used with flow meters, the voltage signals uh, with a wide variety of equipment, tilt acceleration. We have a small waterproof data logger. It's actually used for um, some water measurements for current, but it's also used to track the movement of cattle and the health of dairy farms. The outdoor measurements, again, um, from the bottom, these are the data loggers that have been around for quite a while. We were uh, one of the first people ever to have a data transfer device called a shuttle that would take the place of that base station that is pictured that is your USB connection to a computer. 
Um, there's a shuttle available that is waterproof and could do a fast transfer and bank any of the outdoor data loggers that are sealed to be waterproof. Uh, the model shown in that diagram is temperature and relative humidity. It's also available for two temperatures, uh, ideal for maybe an air temperature and a soil temperature, for example. At the top, our RX3000 wireless sensor network. Uh, weather stations can be customized to what you need. They have a three-year rechargeable battery. They're kept running on that solar panel. The batteries can be replaced. These have a long lifespan. Uh, we have people using data loggers in the field and our weather stations in the field for over 10 years. They're flexible. So if you have one um, sensor in the field, let's say you have a soil moisture sensor that somehow got damaged, that somebody ran over something with a tractor or a squirrel loved to chew on it, and that cable is damaged, you can just get a, a new sensor and re replace it it will pick, be picked up by the station automatically uh, once it reconnects. On the right-hand side is a USB-style weatherproof data logger. You see that bunch of grapes and um, the closed weatherproof container. That data logger gives you a lot of flexibility if you only need maybe five measurements and you're gonna visit that site every so often. It's a nice uh, cost-effective method. And on the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a weatherproof data logger, which is Bluetooth. Um, great for temperature and relative humidity in a greenhouse type situation. That could get sprayed, that could be outside in rain. It's gonna collect data for as long as you need it, and you're reading it out to your smart device. And an overview of uh, some of the underwater measurement data loggers. I will start at the bottom left. We have a dissolved oxygen data logger. It has a replaceable six month cap. This uses um, RDO rugged technology. These also have a long life factory replaceable batteries. Right above it is our standalone water level data logger. This is used in areas where you are in a river, for example, where there's a lot of traffic, people, canoes, boats, you don't want anything sticking up out of the water. You wanna camouflage it. You wanna leave it for a long time. You will have that data whenever you're ready to visit that site and retrieve it. Right above that, if you want to do groundwater wells, but you don't wanna dig it up or pick it up out of that well, you're going to mount it so your water level transducer is in the water. Above it is a top end that's also measuring barometric pressure. It's communicating to your smart device within 100 feet and doing a barometric calculation for you. So your data file is going to give you water level, temperature, and pressure. Down the center, you'll see the yellow tidbit. Uh, it's a waterproof temperature data logger. It's rated to 400 feet. Uh, two tenths of a degree C accuracy, that's about half a degree Fahrenheit. It also can give a, a, an event if it's in an ephemeral stream. So if you're in of any of areas where sometimes these, these riverbeds might dry out and you want to know that, you can place that logger in the water. It will constantly record temperature, but if water hits it or it, it's a, it is exposed, it will record an event in your data file. The green labeled pendant is also Bluetooth to your cell phone, a little bit less expensive. They're around $54, uh, a little bit less accurate, less than one degree um, Fahrenheit, but you can buy a lot of these data loggers so you can place a lot of them underwater. Um, you can also get a light measurement, good for al algae or eelgrass studies, and you can put a lot of uh, of them in an area so you get a good profile of what's happening. The orange label in the middle is our tidbit that's been around for a long time. Uh, ideally, it was a small size that people liked. Uh, could be used in beehives, for example. It can be used for soil temperatures. It is rated to a thousand feet underwater, um, used for a lot of variety of whenever you need 
a waterproof, completely sealed temperature data logger. Top right hand corner is our uh, Water Temp Pro V2. We're showing it in a coral reef because it's very accurate. It's also excellent for very cold applications. The battery is rated to negative 40 and it has a six year battery, factory replaceable. The conductivity logger, uh, they can be used for fresh water road runoff to uh, track saltwater intrusion. There is a salinity logger as well. Um, based on the kind of accuracy you need and the details you need, you would choose the correct range for your application. And I will launch the next poll question to see what is your primary application for data loggers. Eileen, the poll is launched and we have the results pouring in. Right now it's looking like about 50% of the people joining us today on this webinar are in the building performance monitoring market. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna give this just another minute here. We'll let those results round out and I'll go ahead and close the poll and share that information with everyone. Okay, so as you can see from those results, still a strong finish for our building performance monitoring. In second place, we have outdoor and environmental monitoring followed by water monitoring. Thank you all for taking that poll and I'll go ahead and close this out for you. Thank you, Taryn. All right, so when you're considering what you need, the first thing you're gonna ask yourself is what do you need to measure? If you give us a call and say, here's what I wanna do, and we will say exactly what do you wanna measure um, and for how long, uh, the environment, we just went over uh, some of what those data loggers are designed for. Uh, is it a one-time situation or do you wanna put a toolkit together for building performance monitoring, for example? And how often do you want to access the data? And how do you want to access the data? Like if you're somebody who's going to like the Bluetooth, we're going to try and customize a solution uh, so that you're getting data via Bluetooth. And under the what do you want to measure and for how long category, we would determine um, which data logger is going to run the longest because it has a lot of memory, what kind of battery you may need, and we will talk about this a little bit more. Um, measurement accuracy, some people know exactly that they need something better than half a degree Fahrenheit for certain applications. Um, they also know they can use Bluetooth or in some companies they don't want uh, Bluetooth communication or wireless, they want to do a USB. You also want to determine how flexible the software is. People like our software. Um, the battery life, of course, almost all of them are at least one year. Some of the data, data loggers are more than that and whether or not the batteries are uh, user replaceable, factory replaceable. One of the things with Bluetooth loggers is most of them are user replaceable. It was something our uh, customers had requested for a, a long time. Uh, the only ones that are not are those that are truly factory sealed to be waterproof. Uh, what is your cost of ownership? Are there recurring plans? Um, and is there good product support? And we have a good reputation for offering that product support. And we're gonna talk about data access options. USB loggers, typically for indoors, but we do have outdoor loggers that use that as well. It means you're going to connect that piece of hardware that has the battery and the memory and the electronics by a USB cable to your computer. And when you're using a USB data logger, we're showing you um, 
two variations. The, the first picture at the top left under configure and launch is a small indoor data logger. The one on the right where you see that blue label is a waterproof temperature data logger where it's being slid into uh, an optical reader which gives you the connection to the computer. Number two, you are securing it where you want it to be logging, whether it's in your building space, whether it's in a museum or next to a piece of art, whether you are in your building and you want to be monitoring the temperatures. Three, you're going to download and access your data after this has been set to record. Let's say you want to check on it every week. You're going to make sure you've set it to uh, your recording interval and tell it when to start. When you're ready to see that data, you're grabbing it, you're reconnecting it to the computer or to that base station or shuttle, and then you're going to read out the data, you're going to see it on your computer, where you'll be able to work with that data file, um, send it, or share it. Uh, this is a, a quick overview of Hoboware software and what the screen might look like. These are typically very easy to use. It, does give you a lot of flexibility. Um, there are lots of features and you can do an easy export which is important these days. I will tell you we do have a separate webinar called Ask the Experts on specific software capabilities that um, we would spend more time in addressing your particular questions. We also have tech support who helps uh, if you need help with setting up the Hoboware software. And of course, there are good directions in the manuals. We always suggest you read those manuals. The other new option in the last few years are the Bluetooth data loggers. The beauty of this is you can set it in an area, let's say you have something high up, you don't need to retrieve it to read it out. It's going to communicate to your smart device within 100 feet. Um, we have some indoor loggers, outdoor loggers, and underwater data loggers that use Bluetooth. They're not communicating when they're underwater, but it eliminates that additional piece of hardware and uh, makes you uh, able to carry one device, your smartphone. When you're using the Bluetooth data logger, um, this is a quick shot of what your graph looks like on the screen. You are able to send it, share it. I'll show that uh, in just a moment. Uh, we're giving you an example of a, a cold room at the top right-hand side. We have hobo loggers for temperature and relative humidity. We do have a separate uh, product line for the pharmaceutical industry uh, that comes with NIST certification. So if that's uh, an area where you need to monitor refrigerators or freezers, we would point you in that direction and, and guide you accordingly. And again, on the bottom, the Hobo Mobile app, which is free. You download that to your phone, it's going to find that device, and you don't have to remove everything. It gives you that easy access. Little bit better view of what this looks like on your phone. Uh, it's going to find it. You're going to configure it. By configure, we mean um, set up that logging interval, just like setting up an appointment on your uh, iPhone. You're setting up the date and time, the interval. Um, when you're uh, reading it out, you will have a graph. And on the right-hand side, you're just tapping on the images and the way you'd like to share it. You can share it as an Excel file, a CSV, a text file, or a Hobo file, or just an image and send that. And last, but certainly extremely pop popular these days, we have web-based systems. So they do have the capability of wireless, um, what we're calling data nodes for temperature and relative humidity that can get, for example, three, um, 2,000 feet line of sight. Uh, different wireless sensors are available for that weather station. You can do rainfall, you can do um, sensors at the main device. When you're setting this up, you can set up wireless sensors um, for buildings, indoors, 
and also for agricultural type applications. What that allows you to do, once this is set up, you are viewing this on your browser. This is a quick view of, of what these screens might look like. Um, you give uh, you have the capability of adding flexible modules. It can be water level, it can be analog inputs, or it can be wireless sensors. You have the capability of adding two styles of these modules based on what you need to do, and we customize a system based on, on your needs. Now, alarms can be set on these uh, sensor parameters, the um, screen shot at the bottom is showing more of the building style using web-based loggers. Both of them are using what we call Hobo Link. So your data is displayed on your browser, on your computer. You'll have that time and date and text data, but you can also customize a dashboard. This can be done on indoor loggers, with a gateway that plugs into your web-based um, systems. It needs your um, Wi-Fi or Ethernet in the building. Uh, on the outdoor systems, it's Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or cellular. That new MX gateway, uh, we came out with this in, I think, early fall of last year. So if you're placing Bluetooth loggers throughout a building facility, and that can include temperature relative humidity data loggers, um, the supply and return temperature data loggers, AC current, you are, and if you have the Wi-Fi or Ethernet capability in that building, you can set that up so that you log in to Hobo Link from your smart device that you can view that data. Uh, you do have unlimited cloud storage. It is held on that on Hobo Link. It will track that for last, the last few days, the last weeks, the last, or several months. And it is stored uh, for quite a long period of time. And again, when you're setting it up, you do need to be within a 100 foot range. You do need to be within 100 uh, foot range of your gateway, which is that device that is pictured. Some of the web-based systems, we're kind of covering a lot of territory in this overview. So on the top right-hand side, you're seeing what looks like that white box. It is um, going to use cellular service. And these will be very flexible based on what wireless sensors you want to add. You can set up alarms based on a sensor parameter, such as um, temperature, relative humidity, and, and others, of course. If you're, and it's going to run on batteries, of course, for indoors. It also can be plugged into power. Uh, again, all of our systems have a lot of flexibility, and we're happy to help configure exactly what you need. And we do have detailed walkthroughs on our website that, that help uh, with that. Outdoors, the picture on the bottom right, that data logger has a solar panel built into it, and you can attach a water level sensor to that. You can also do some of the wireless sensors and um, get that through Hobo Link. A little bit of a close up view of, again, how this is going to look maybe in raw data on your screen and then you can customize a dashboard view for exactly what you want to see. This is a customized dashboard. Um, once you have this set up, you can add to this at any time, customize it the way you want to view it. And that it can be on the indoor loggers or the outdoor loggers. Again, a, a, what I think is a nicer view of some of the um, dashboards that can be customized. A little bit of an overview of some indoor uh, monitoring applications. 
temperature and relative humidity is important in any areas that have had uh, unfortunately nat natural disasters like flooding or just water damage in apartment buildings and this is a particular uh, application where they used our temperature and relative humidity data loggers set them up to record for a period of time to watch that dry down and predict uh, when this was ready to be repaired and predict mold risk. The MX1101 is the indoor temperature relative humidity data logger. Um, that particular building, they recorded every 10 minutes over a two month period. It grabbed the trends that they needed to see in order to make decisions on what needed to be uh, improved. And they knew what was going on in that building. Again, um, they could deploy these and not have to enter the building. They could put these throughout an apartment building, for example, and record the data from within 100 feet. It will travel um, through walls, uh, not maybe one foot thick concrete walls, but we have a solution for that as, as well. The RX systems actually can, can get quite a bit of communication. Eileen, before you jump on from this slide, do you want to talk a little bit about the MX Gateway? We have a couple of questions and this might be a good time to touch on that again. Oh, sure. Um, the MX Gateway does need to be plugged into power. It is going to operate off the building's Wi-Fi or Ethernet. It does need to be within a 100 foot range of one of the data loggers. They will communicate with each other, kind of a mesh network piece, and it will save that data. You can set alarms and you can set it to upload to Hobo Link so you can view it. Do we have a, a particular question or concern? And it is for indoors on the gateway. No, I think you've answered it. That's a good points to make, Eileen. Thank you. We will jump ahead and we will provide more details of, of, of course and uh, answer any particular questions uh, after the webinar. Uh, again, this is an overview of tracking energy use. Um, this was a particular project where the company was trying to uh, find out why their electric bills were so high. And they were trying to manage the facilities at this uh, printing facility, for example, and perhaps be able to monitor at lower demand times. We did suggest the RX3000 uh, so that they could use the building's Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and it's recording data close to real time. This is a system diagram where they would use one of the RX 3000s. Um, again, it can use the cellular service, Wi-Fi or Ethernet of the building. Uh, it's attached to a pulse output electric meter. They could set this up to monitor the kilowatt hours and when this was occurring. So they could decide that they could make changes based on when these machines were running. Um, the owner of this uh, particular project said the ability to view data remotely uh, allowed us to see how much energy we were consuming. And when a company is being charged a demand rate, uh, understanding the profile in real time, close to real time, is critical in, in reducing usage and saving money. And water monitoring applications. That is a lovely picture of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, the Sandwich Boardwalk and Wetlands. And we like that picture. Water temperature monitoring. This is also a particular project where um, a temperature data logger was used to restore uh, a freshwater ecosystem at Rudio Creek in Oregon. 
Uh, Rudio Creek uh, is a tributary of the John Day River in central Oregon. It's the second longest free-flowing river in the United States. And uh, the Yellowstone is the longest. But they were looking to restore habitat for summer steelhead and spring Chinook fish. Uh, temperatures were as high as 80 degrees Fahrenheit in late summer. And that was creating a problem for fish survival and reproduction. What they used at the time, because it had a six-year battery, this was a long project. Uh, it's a rugged data logger, was just a waterproof temperature data logger. Um, they did deploy these at several sections uh, between three natural springs, and they were able to monitor what was happening in each of those areas to see as they were um, redesigning that flow, what was the best a solution and how it was affecting the temperature. Um, and this again was a five to six year project. The battery life on this was an advantage. They did chart the stream flow and the temperature information and they were able to determine uh, how the changes that they'd made in the connection of these springs uh, was affecting the temperature being lowered in the stream. Uh, what they had done is set it up for 30 minute intervals. They downloaded this four times a year. They did use our, our shuttle. And now it could also be done with a Bluetooth device. This would have the same accuracy rating. Um, it does have an advantage of uh, a long battery, but user replaceable with people that people liked. Uh, our data loggers and stations are used in a lot of environmental monitoring applications. A very typical uh, monitoring method right now is temperature and relative humidity in um, fields for site selection. You're going to collect data easily. Um, and set it up on your Bluetooth device. Again, they were doing um, Bluetooth. They set these up throughout the field. They were able to monitor for a long period of time and collect data during the growing season. It helped determine what they were planting where and uh, the best solutions for certain areas. Evaluation of crop growing requirements and microclimate really used quite a bit for grapes uh, or any other agricultural product where you're trying to plan or greenhouses where you're trying to plan uh, what is the optim optimal um, temperature and relative humidity and for disease modeling, of course. This is an overview of the options when you're going to do more than just temperature and relative humidity and maybe use this in an agricultural setting, you will have wireless temperature sensors available. You can do um, an evapotranspiration. You can do uh, uh, large fields for site selection. It gives you a lot of flexibility to add up to 50 sensors or e even more. Uh, one of the things we talked about in the agenda is if you're getting a data logger and planning on how long it's going to last, do you have long-term projects, you want to make sure you have good product support. Uh, Onset has been in business for, I think, 39 years. We're going on 40, and we plan to, to continue that. We do have technical support available, 8 o'clock to 6 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Uh, via phone, chat, or email. We do provide logger repair uh, for those um, loggers that are in the field for a long time whenever they need it, and battery replacement service for those that are sealed to be completely uh, waterproof, for example. Resources. Uh, our website has a lot of information. 
what I and my colleagues do is uh, kind of help uh, make sense of all of the available information, but it is a great resource. We have application stories. So we're giving you some real world examples and there is quite a bit to choose from. You can go onto the site, choose the market that you are in, whether that's indoor or outdoor or underwater and get some real life examples and see what they used and how they used it. And we're always happy to help with that as well. We do have a knowledge base that our tech support staff had uh, helped put together for typical frequently asked questions. And we have product documentation, support wiring diagrams, forum posts for unique uh, applications. And we have a solutions search engine, which will help guide you to the right product. And of course, you have live human beings <laughs> that are also able to assist. And Taryn, do we have any particular questions? Thank you, Eileen. I will say I've been frantically typing. I'm actually quite proud of myself. I've, I've tried to answer as many of these questions as they came in. Uh, but I do want to say one thing I seem to be typing over and over again is I, I really would recommend a lot of people reach out to our application experts because everyone's application is unique and just slightly different. So in order for us to give you the best possible suggestion, I, I would really recommend you give us a call, tell us all about your lovely ap application, then we can really lead you uh, in the right direction. So Eileen, um, I'll start you off with one question that comes up pretty frequently, um, is really just what's the difference between HoboWare and HoboWare Pro? Uh, HoboWare Pro is the platform that's going to offer what we call data assistance. It's for the loggers that are going to do more for you. So for example, if you have uh, the building application and you want kilowatt hours and you're using the USB style data loggers, that has a calculator for kilowatt hours on it. And that would be required. It would be part of our energy logger suite and we will have, certainly have more details on the indoor building applications in an upcoming webinar. Hoboware Pro also does growing degree days. It does the calculation for water level. Um, when you're reading a, a water level data logger, it gives you temperature, pressure, and it is a calculation in the software that gives you the water level, pardon me, water level in your data file. So Hoboware Pro is required for certain more sophisticated data loggers, for the most part, most of what I had covered here with, we were talking quite a bit about temperature and relative humidity. Our free version of HoboWare is sufficient to run that. That's a free download. And the USB cable is a $10 cable. It's a standard USB mini B cable for HoboWare. And while I'm touching on that, um, the Bluetooth again was a free app. And the um, Hobo Link runs, will run and be more sophisticated. That is also, uh, depending if you're using Wi Fi or Ethernet or cellular, the Hobo Link has a lot of built in features and um, is going to do those calculations uh, for you. Great, thank you, Eileen. So I'll cover a couple of these questions for us. Um, I saw a few different people asking about what types of sensors do we offer for monitoring soil temperature as well as soil and moisture. I'm really excited to see those questions and I want to encourage everybody to stay tuned. Onset is coming out with a few new sensors in the near future, um, but we do have options that are available today. So certainly feel free to give us a call. We can walk you through what options we have at the moment, both wireless sensors as well as wired ones. Uh, but again, stay tuned. We have some new options coming in the near future. Um, one of the other questions was, will the RX3000 read KWH directly? I'm gonna tell you yes, but you're going to need a particular sensor called a watt node. So give us a call. We can certainly walk you through that. We also have the EG4100 series, which might be a good option for you. That question uh, pretty much answers Peter's question there. 
Um, Eileen, Steve was asking about uh, you mentioning the three-year battery life for the RX 3000. Um, so Steve, just to clarify, that is a rechargeable battery. Uh, and Eileen did mention it's typically a three-year life, but that really depends upon the application. So somebody using it, uh, you know, indoors in a relatively comfortable environment may see a significantly longer lifespan out of their rechargeable battery, where some of our friends deploying these in the Arctic may be putting their battery through some pretty harsh conditions, and those batteries may not last quite as long. So we spec it as three years, but I'll tell you, that's probably us being super, super safe, so we're not sorry. Um, so, I and Eileen, is it three years or five years? I'm, I would add to that, it on the RX 3000, the three-year um, rechargeable battery, the, you won't be surprised the software will tell you when it's starting to get low that and it is something you can replace uh, it costs about a hundred dollars to replace it so you can keep your actual device running for a long time and it will give you plenty of time to know when it's uh, when it's time to get a replaceable battery Thank you, Eileen. Um, and then a cup, just to answer a couple of people's questions in one, we've got questions about how would you recommend mounting something like the DO logger or the conductivity logger? Do you want to give a high level kind of mounting tips for the, some of those particular devices? Oh, absolutely. And we <laughs> and we do have resources that we can provide giving you diagrams, et cetera. Um, in particular, any of those data loggers, we suggest slotted PVC. So you've got, you're gonna slide it into PVC pipe that has holes in it to allow water flowing over it. And it gives the data logger some protection and while still allowing the water to flow over the sensor. And of course you wanna mount it so you can find it again and so it is not lost. Um, Water level, I think this was a question I had seen that had come in previously. Um, you don't want a water level sensor to be buried in silt or dirt. It won't damage the sensor, but it won't read correctly when, when it is in silt, for example, or sediment. What you can do is when you're pulling it back out and retrieving it, you just wash it out a little bit um, and deploy it again. Typically, we say deploy in slotted PVC, dig down uh, a little bit. Uh, you can even cover the bottom sensor of a water level data logger with maybe some landscape fabric on the PVC. It helps keep out a lot of debris and silt to give you that um, better readings for a long time. If you're visiting a site once a month or so, that's pretty good. If you can't visit a site for six months, you want to take some extra precautions on how you set it up and how you deploy it so that again it's it's anchored you don't want them moving around in water you want them stable so that way you're not damaging the electronics or the battery i mean these are pretty rugged devices but with that little bit of extra care um, we do have a housing available um, but most people like doing their own based on where they are um, deploying these Thank you, Eileen. And just to cover a couple other questions here, lots of great questions about monitoring energy consumption. Please feel free to reach out to us. Again, everyone's application's a little bit unique, um, so I definitely don't want to be giving general answers to that. Uh, we certainly can help walk you through your application. A um, few questions came up, came up about the gateway. So the, the way the MX gateway works is it actually pulls your data packets right out of the air. So as your logger saying, here's an advertisement of what data I just collected, uh, that gateway's snatching up that packet and pushing it up to the cloud for you. So a couple of questions was, what happens if the power goes out and the gateway's not working? Yeah, unfortunately the gateway is not working. So it can't be reaching out, snatching up those packets and pushing them to the cloud. So yes, there would be a gap in your data. The good news is the MX loggers have plenty of onboard memory, so they're gonna to continue to log away and store that memory internally. The bad news is you would have to go to the site, open your app, connect up to the logger and offload that historical data. Um, so that, that is a concern some of you have had with the MX gateway. However, I have even better news. If that's something that's gonna be a showstopper for you, I would encourage you to take a look at our new indoor uh, Hobonet 
wa monitoring system. The Hobonet system may be the solution that's going to get around that for you. Not only do the wireless sensors have their own onboard memory, but the logger itself does as well. Uh, so that may be a great solution for you. Another key thing with that device is uh, you could go the cellular option. The cellular option, you're going to lose power, but the cellular is still available, still working. Uh, so you're not going to run into those data gaps you'd see using the gateway. Uh, let's see here, a couple of other questions. Um, people are asking about, can you turn the older version uh, loggers that we have that are our U-series um, that use a USB cable to into Bluetooth ones? No, there's no way at the moment to turn them into Bluetooth loggers. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'm sure someone has creatively come up with some sort of crazy engineered component to do that, but it's not something Onset currently works with or, or recommends doing. Uh, you would need to use the Bluetooth loggers if you want to have them directly connect to your smart device. Uh, let's see here. Is the Hoboware Pro format available online and does it support U12 loggers? Yes, it does. Uh, you can either download the Hoboware Pro uh, software straight from our website for $75. Or if you're using the U12 loggers, like Eileen said earlier, you may be able to get away with just using the free version. So you may want to try the free version to start. And if you decide you need to upgrade, you certainly can do so. Uh, let's see here, Eileen, a couple other questions. Uh, yes, a reminder to everyone, this webinar is being recorded. So if you would like to view it over and over and over again, for your own joy and pleasure or share it with a coworker, you can absolutely do that. We will send out a link to the webinar uh, recording after this. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm sorry, I'm frantically scrolling through your questions. I must say you guys have been a wonderful group of a attendees. Thank you so much. I don't think I've ever had so many questions sent out during a webinar. So I'm really excited you guys were engaged uh, and I hope we were able to answer a lot of your questions, but don't fret if we di didn't, uh, certainly feel free to give us a call if you need help immediately. Otherwise uh, we will reach out to you in the future and see if there's something we can help you with. But again, don't wait for us. Certainly give us a call if there's any questions we didn't answer. We'd love to help you. Uh, we have plenty of application specialists that are available that can certainly spend the time to go over what your needs are and provide you with the best possible solution to meet them. So with that, Eileen, thank everybody for their time here. And thank you, Eileen. You did a great job. Uh, and everybody have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be in touch.